Hello and welcome back to All About Russia. My name's Andrew and in this episode we're going to be looking at one of the most un-Russian of the Russian republics, the Republic of Chechnya. The Republic of Chechnya, or Nochina Republika, is located in the south of Russia, in the North Caucasian Economic Region and in the North Caucasian Federal District. Within the Russian Federation, it shares borders with Dagestan to the east, Stavropol Krai to the north, and both the Republic of Ingushetia and North Ossetia to the west. It also shares a border with the nation of Georgia to the south. The Republic is 6,700 square miles in size, making it the 76th largest federal subject in the Russian Federation and larger than the nation of East Timor. Its population stands at just over one and a quarter million people, making it the 40th largest federal subject by population. The Republic of Chechnya is incredibly mountainous, which given the fact that it's in the North Caucasus is perhaps not that surprising, and thus only a fifth of land is forested. Farmland is even smaller than this, at just under 15% of land under cultivation. The highest point in the Republic is Mount Tebelusmota, at over 4,500 metres high. The name of the mountain comes from the Chechen language itself, and actually translates to something along the lines of place of the village of Tebel. The longest river in the Republic is the River Terek, of which 218 kilometres flow through the Republic of Chechnya. The Republic of Chechnya is also on Moscow's standard time. It is, of course, the Republic of the Chechen people, and both Chechen and Russian have official status in this Republic. The flag of the Republic is a 2 to 3 ratio red and green design, divided by white with a golden ornament on the left hand side. The green is to represent Islam the primary religion of the Chechen people. The red is to represent the blood of those who had fallen for Chechnya in the past, while white represents peace. The golden ornamental design signifies the richness of Chechen culture and tradition. This flag was designed by none other than Chechnya's president, Ramzan Kadyrov, in 2004 and has been in use since that time. The Republic of Chechnya is divided into 15 administrative divisions, with the capital in the city of Grozny, which acts as its own administrative district. Interestingly, each of these administrative districts have its Russian and Chechen names, which are often completely separate and mean completely separate things. The greatest example of this actually lies in the capital of Grozny, which translates to something along the lines of fearsome or awesome in Russian, which in Chechen is called Solzhe Glazhe, or the city on the river Solzhe. Archaeologists have traced human settlement in Chechnya all the way back to 40,000 BC. Cave paintings and tools found dating from around this period in Lake Kazonayam indicate a hunter-gatherer culture existing 40,000 years ago. Who these people were though we're not quite sure, as our first written records actually come from Greek sources who record the natural tribe as being in the area. Ethno-linguistic researchers actually think this natural tribe are the modern day Chechens, as the native name for Chechen people is Nakchoi, sounding very similar. In the Chechen language, this translates to something similar to insiders, and is something we will explore more, of course, in our video on the Chechen people. In the 6th century, invaders from the north, first in the form of the Sumerians, then the Scythians, came into the modern day Chechen Republic. These invaders formed the Chechens away from the fertile plains and into the more rugged valleys and hills. These invasions forced the natural people to diverge and, and separated by geography look for different assistance outside. This in turn put them into greater contact with the Greeks and important for our story, the Georgians. The 7th century saw the arrival of the Alans, again from the north, who subjugated modern day Chechnya and incorporated it into their kingdom of Alania. The Kingdom of Alania was a multi-ethnic state, including many people and places, including modern-day Chechnya. However, the following century, a new invader from the north arrived, one that would subjugate both the Natchi tribes and their Alanian overlords, the Khazars. It's during this time of the 8th century that we first find records of a proto-Chechen state, 
Dirdzuketia, Dirdzuketia was a state within the Kingdom of Alania which owed fealty to the Khazars. It was heavily influenced by the neighbouring Georgians and would adopt Christianity as its state religion in the 10th century. The Arab Khazar Wars of the previous century had brought the Chechens into contact with Islam. However, it was adopted by very few people and was largely seen as a religion of the invaders. The people of Dirdzuketia would prove instrumental in halting the advance of the Arab armies and would grow in prosper under Khazar overlordship during this time. Archaeologists have found evidence of trade from as far away as Baghdad being conducted through what is now Chechnya. However, as Khazar influence waned with the rise of the Rus to the north, the influence they could emit onto the Chechens diminished and the Dirtzuketians found themselves being more and more influenced by Georgian princes. This would continue until the Mongol invasion. The Mongols invaded the Caucasus in the 13th century, first overrunning the Khazars, then the Alanians, and finally the Dirtzuketians. The plains of Dirtzuketia were ravaged, and those who survived only did so by fleeing into the mountains. Interestingly, many historians view this period of time as a great blending of the peoples of the Northern Caucasus, with evidence of Circassian and Alanian elements being included in the native Dirtzuketian or Chechen population. Despite bringing terrible destruction to the land, the Mongols never established a firm rulership of the area, and fighting would commence almost immediately from those who had survived. Throughout the 14th century, bands of Chechens would move down from the mountains to try and reclaim parts of their land, being forced back and trying again at various different points. Islam first makes real progress for the Chechen people during this time period. Simsir, a small Chechen princedom which owed fealty to the Khazars, swapped sides almost immediately that the Mongols invaded and were able to survive by doing so. This subservience was so much so that when in 1313, Khan Uzbek of the Golden Horde adopted Islam as his state religion, the Chechens in Simsir did likewise. The Mongols heralded a period of great devastation for the Chechens, which would be continued in 1390 with the arrival of Timurlain. Timurlain ravaged the Chechen plain, destroying the Prince of Simsir and causing the Chechens who had come down from the mountains to retreat back to them once more. As both Tamerlane and the Golden Horde's power waned, Chechens once again tried retreating from the mountains and occupying their fertile plains once again. However, they found themselves in contact with Kumiks, a Turkic people who had been brought by the Mongols into the area. As the Kumiks tried to force overlordship on the Chechen tribes, fighting broke out, and there was evidence that some Kabardian princes from the west similarly tried to exert influence on the Chechen people. Both the Kumiks and the Kabardians had little success, particularly in the southeast, where another proto-Chechen state, Ichkiria, was founded around the Iskard River. Firearms brought in from competing Ottoman and Persians for influence with the Chechens were used to great effect by these guerrilla mountain people. The introduction of gunpowder would change dramatically the way fighting was conducted in the Caucasus and to the great benefit of the Chechen people. This plays an important role in later Chechen history, particularly with the arrival of a new power on the banks of the Terek, Muscovy. Russia first appeared on the banks of the Terek River, historically seen as a border of Chechnya, in 1577. The Grebi Cossack host had been there before this point and are of unknown origin. However, in this year they swore fealty to the Tsar and thus became Russian subjects and brought the Russian border to Chechnya. Over the 16th and 17th centuries, the Kumik, Kabardian and Nogai Tata influence in the region waned as the Cossacks grew in power. This brought the Cossacks and the Chechens into greater conflict, as both were competing for resources in the area. As time went on, this tit for tat raiding lifestyle would develop and expedite to terrible consequences. As the Ottomans were providing more firearms to the Chechens throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, they tended to have more influence than their Persian rivals. This included into matters of religion, where Sunni Islam took a greater hold of the Chechen people. However, this would increase dramatically in the 19th century, when Orthodox Imperial Russian forces arrived in great numbers in the Caucasus. In 1722, the first encounters of Imperial Russian forces and Chechens came to blows during the Russo-Persian War of that same year. 
In 1785, Imam Mansur led a huge coalition of many peoples of the Northern Caucasus, including Chechens, to attack Imperial Russian forces, which were encroaching ever further on the native tribes of the region. With the Treaty of Gulistan between Persia and Russia in 1813, huge swathes of the Caucasus were given over to the Russians. This in turn led to them leaving more troops into the area and building more forts, notably one in 1818, on the future site of Grozny. In 1829, due to growing escalation between Russian and Chechen forces, the Murid War began. This was the first time that Russian forces had invaded Chechnya properly with a plan of attack. In a grim parallel to the invasion of Circassia that we've seen in previous episodes, the similar tactics were used where villages were burned and men, women and children indiscriminately shot by Russian forces. This in turn led the Chechens to conduct a guerrilla campaign sniping from the mountains to terrible effect. Similarly, many Chechens opted to leave their ancestral land and head instead to friendly Muslim states such as the Ottoman Empire. Those who remained, later fighting under Imam Shamil, fought a desperate rearguard action and many, if not all, were faced with complete destruction. After 30 years of fighting, most of Chechnya had been pacified and the next year it was incorporated as the Chechen district of the Terek Blast. After the war, loyal Cossack and Russian forces were brought into Chechnya to settle and change the demographics of that area. Several of the fortresses which had been built to protect against Chechen attacks transformed themselves into towns, including Grozny, which was officially titled in 1870. Those Chechens who remained were driven to the mountains and rugged foothills, generally the poorer land. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, this provoked great unrest, and in 1877 a great Chechen revolt was crushed by Russian forces. This led to more suppression and more land being taken away from the Chechens. As the population and authority of Russia grew in the region, more infrastructure was needed, and in 1893 Grozny was linked with Moscow by railway. That same year, oil was discovered near Grozny as well and by the turn of the century would turn Grozny into an oil town and the oil capital of the Caucasus. With the start of the First World War and the chaos that followed the February Revolution, Chechens gathered together in Grozny and formed the Chechen Committee. This led to the region being included in the largely Caucasian-led Mountain Republic of the North Caucasus. This was not well received at all by the non-Chechen elements in Republic and led immediately to fighting, with Cossacks actually seizing Grozny in March of that year. In December of that year, the capital would be retaken by Chechen forces of the Wild Division originally created to help fight in the First World War. However, in January of the following year, the city was peacefully passed over to Bolshevik forces from Vladikavkaz, incorporated into the Terek Soviet Republic two months later. Given the repression which had taken place during the imperial period towards the Chechen, the Bolshevik ideology of equality for all nationalities was very appealing to many of the Chechen people. It's worth bearing at this time though, that it wasn't just Chechen nationalists, Cossacks and Bolshevik forces present in the Republic, there were also fundamentalist Islamic sects as well. Crossing over from neighbouring Dagestan in September 1918, Uzun Haji would take control of much of southern Chechnya, incorporating it into his North Caucasian Emirate. This would last until March of 1920, when Uzun suddenly died, and the whole of Chechnya was incorporated into the Soviet Union as the Mountain Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. In 1922, the region would be reallocated as the Chechen Autonomous Oblast into the North Caucasian Krai. This would remain the case until 1934. Almost immediately, however, the Soviet state found problems in Chechnya, with the Chechens unwilling to give up their grain quotas and comply with some of the more atheistic or severe Soviet demands. This was only exacerbated in the 1930s, when Ukrainians fleeing the Holodomor arrived in Chechnya, bringing tales of the devastation from state confiscations. In Chechen tradition, this actually culminated in an uprising in 1932, which was brutally put down by the Soviet state. Low-level fighting would however continue all the way into the 1940s. In 1936, the Chechen Autonomous Oblast was merged with the English Autonomous Oblast to create the Chechen English Autonomous Oblast. 
The Chechens and the English are very similar, if not the same people, by a different name. And thus this merging was greatly received by both the Chechen and English elites. With the Soviet failings in the 1940 Winter War against Finland, insurgent forces in Chechnya viewed this as a great opportunity. Merbek Sheripov, a Chechen guerrilla fighter, rose up and took control of much of southern and central Chechnya during this year. With the Nazi invasion in 1941, Chechnya and its oil grew of interest to the Nazi war machine. They at first tried to recruit Chechen forces but when that failed, opted to start a bombing campaign against Grozny in October of 1942. Thousands of Chechens joined the Red Army to help defend their nation in its hour of need. However, an equally large number of Chechens did actually defect from the Red Army and join Merbek in his insurgency in 1942. Historians quote this figure at around 60,000. Since its inclusion in the Soviet Union, Chechnya had had problems and minor irritations for the Soviet state, but this would be the straw that broke the camel's back, and the hammer was quick to fall on the Chechen people. In 1943, the immediate Nazi threat to the Soviet state was removed, and under the pretext of mending bridges which had been damaged in the area, 120,000 Soviet troops and NKVD were brought into Chechnya. In what was named Operation Lentil, Stalin had decided to remove the Chechen problem once and for all. Under the accusation of collaboration, the entire Chechen population, men, women and children, were gathered up, put into trucks meant for animals and sent off to Central Asia, where they were dumped. No food, no water, no shelter. Those who resisted were shot and few managed to hide from the Soviet troops. This includes the Chechens who had fought for the Red Army, who were disarmed, disbanded and then shipped off to Central Asia as well. This went so far as to dissolve the Chechen English Autonomous Soviet Republic, with its territory divided between Dagestan, Stavropol Krai and Georgia. The land was repopulated with loyal Russian, Ukrainian, Georgian and Armenian elements in what was named by the Chechens as the Ardak. We will of course explain this in more detail when we discuss the Chechen people and their history. Like much of the Soviet Union, after the Second World War a period of industrialization and reconstruction emerged. This would continue throughout the 40s and 50s, yet in 1957 Premier Khrushchev announced the right for national minorities who had been deported away from their homelands to return. This included the Chechens. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, returning home to find other people living in your house, using your tools and farming your land did not make the Chechens very happy when they returned. This in turn led to the Grozny Riots of 1958, which pitted the Chechens against a plethora of nationalities who had now been living in their actual houses. Ironically, the Chechens had been placed back into the fertile lowlands in an attempt to help assimilate them into Soviet society. However, following these riots, the Chechens were again removed to the more rugged and mountainous parts of Chechnya, where they were treated largely as second-class citizens, unable to run for official positions of office, even though on paper they legally could. In 1985, with the rise of Mikhail Gorbachev and the opening of the Soviet system, the Chechens took a renewed interest in both their history and their own representation. Doku Zagayev, the first Chechen leader of the Republic, was elected four years later. And following Boris Yeltsin's advice to take as much autonomy as they could manage, started taking more control of things in Chechnya. In 1990, the Chechen Republic of Nokchicho was declared, raising it from an autonomous republic to a Soviet Republic. We have discussed the difference between an autonomous republic and a Soviet Republic in previous episodes. But to briefly summarize, a Soviet Republic has greater control over the financial independence of its own public and is less reliant on Moscow and the Soviet hierarchy. However, the writing was on the wall, and amid the chaos of the early 1990s, the Chechen Republic of Echekeria was declared under Zoka Dodaev. Other YouTube channels have done a fantastic job in explaining the chaos between 1990 and 2000 in Chechnya, and so I will just do a brief summary here. After declaring independence in 1991, the English section of the population broke away after opting to join Russia, while the Republic fell into anarchy, with armed militias established by presidential decree. 
anti-Russian sentiment rose in the Republic and non-Chechen elements fled en masse whilst Chechnya became a safe haven for criminals and jihadists. Russia disastrously invaded in 1994 in the first Chechen war in an attempt to incorporate Chechnya back into the fold but failed miserably only uniting Chechens of different views for a common cause against them whilst leaving much of the country in tatters. This quickly fell apart however when Dudayev was killed with a rocket attack in 1996 and the next elected president, Aslan Makadov, was unable to rein in the militias Dudayev had established. A combination of an Islamic fundamentalist invasion of Dagestan, which we mentioned in our Andy video, check that out if you haven't, as well as terrorist attacks on Russian soil itself, led to the Second Chechen War. For the Chechens, it was equally as devastating as the First War, with Grozny pretty much level. However, this time the Chechens were not united, and many of the Chechen factions sided with the Russians halfway through the war, not agreeing with the fundamentalist direction that the Republic was heading in. The Second Chechen War came to an end in the year 2000, and the Republic of Chechnya was confirmed, a state which had existed according to the Russian government since 1993. From 2000 onward saw a period of reconstruction and rehabilitation for both the Chechen landscape and Chechen people. New homes and new mosques were built and new jobs created to help draw support away from the more radical sects present in Chechnya at that time. Having retreated to the mountains, an insurgency campaign would continue officially until 2009, but there have been terrorist incidents up to and including last year. The Islamic influence in modern Chechnya cannot be underrated. With part of the open Islamification of this supposedly secular state to help draw a support away from the radical elements still present in Chechnya. However, despite the reconstruction of Chechnya into a modern, striking, beautiful state, alarming reports came out in 2017 indicating that gay concentration camps were present and being built in Chechnya. Sorry, am I reading this right? Gay concentration camps? Are you serious? Yes, dear viewer. In 2017, reports came out of there being gay concentration camps established in Chechnya. What is equally worrying is when challenged about this, the President of the Republic, Ramzan Kadyrov, claimed that there were simply no gay people in Chechnya. It seems that behind the glittering lights of a modern beautiful state, there still lay something very dark in Chechnya today. The Republic of Chechnya is one of the poorest republics in the Russian Federation, its economy having essentially been dismantled three times between 1990 and 2000. In fact, in 2018, it had the second lowest GDP of any of the federal subjects, second only to neighbouring Ingushetia. The largest industry in the Republic is actually domestic retail trade, which produced last year 55.5 billion rubles over half of the state's revenue. Food production, industrialised output and even oil production remain at relatively low numbers. So how can Chechnya afford buildings such as this? The answer? Subsidies. Yes dear viewer, the Chechen state receives large subsidies from the Russian Federation. In 2017, from a budget of 59.2 billion rubles, 48.5 billion came from the federal government. The Republic has attempted to rejuvenate its image to get rid of the idea of it being an active war zone and the glittering views of Grozny city stand testament to this effort. However, tourism in the region is very low with only 160,000 people visiting last year most of whom were Russian citizens. Given the gorgeous views in the Republic and the examples of places such as Bosnia at changing their image, it may be possible in future years to see Chechnya rebrand itself as a place of beautiful nature. As before stated, the population of Chechnya stands at little over one and a quarter million people as of the 2010 census. This is actually up from the 2002 census. Over a fifth of all people live in the capital of Grozny as of the 2010 census, which again is up from 2002. Historically, the population of Chechnya and of Grozny was both higher and far more diverse. But given the conflicts of the 1990s, we can now see that it's both much smaller and much more homogenous. 
As of the 2010 census, Chechens make up 95.3% of the population, making it one of the few federal subjects where Russians are the minority. The rest of the population is made up of Russians, Kumiks and English. The remaining 1.7% is made up of a plethora of smaller ethnic groups from across Russia and the Caucasus. The birth rate in the Republic is 2.58 which is far higher than the national average of 1.5. As of the 2010 poll conducted in Chechnya, 95% of people profess Sunni Islam as their religion, with the remaining 5% answering Orthodox Christianity. Drug abuse in Chechnya as of 2010 was slightly higher than the national average at 19.68 incidents per 100,000 people. Alcoholism rates however were much lower than the national average at a mere 14.3 incidents per 100,000 people. This is perhaps not surprising when we consider that nearly the entire population adhere to Islam. The head of the Republic is Ramzan Akhmadovich Kadyrov who has been in power since November 2005 first as Prime Minister of a caretaker government, but later appointed as head of the Chechen Republic. He is an ethnic Chechen born in Chechnya, and is in fact the son of one of the pre-presidents of the Republic, Akhmad Kadyrov. In fact, Akhmad Kadyrov's assassination by fundamentalist forces in Chechnya in 2004 to a bomb attack actually helped propel Ramzan's political career. Ramzan is seen as a reliable and trustworthy figure by the Kremlin elite and thus has been kept in power for a great period of time, helping to bring stability and security to Chechnya. Ramzan Kadyrov himself is a very complicated figure, as on the one hand he has certainly brought security and peace to Chechnya. He has brought investment and a rejuvenation of the Republic for its people. He is of course a strong advocate of Chechen rights and the Chechen language. However, this is also the same man who condones honour killings, who has encouraged children to fight each other for sport and of course is currently trying to exterminate gay people in Chechnya. Chechnya is a beautiful republic in the northern Caucasus, filled with natural beauty such as the Kezanoi Am Lake and the Vaduchi Slopes. The land is also littered with many ancient monuments such as the Uskaloid Twin Towers and of course is filled with many modern striking architectural buildings, notably the Akhmad Kadyrov Mosque, the largest mosque in Europe. Despite a stark, bloody and still very raw history, Chechnya is starting to come into the modern world with new buildings and new infrastructure. Unfortunately this beautiful land is still tainted with evils that are presently happening upon it and until those things cease it will never be a prosperous state. My name was Andrew, thank you for watching. Up next is the Chelyabinsk Blask. Paka!